Good afternoon and welcome back. We have 40 industry partners who are exhibiting at this conference and I hope you were able to connect with as many of them as possible during the lunch break and join the competition. Thank you to Dr. Michael Lee for his lunchtime session. It's 2021, where are all the robots? If you have questions for Dr. Lee, you can visit the AAAS Science virtual booth and thank you to our platinum sponsor, AAA Science. My name is Monica Shinako, and I'm connecting from the land of the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Indigenous people attending today. Our next session is a panel session, Artificial Intelligence, Challenging the Nature of Custodianship of Information. Our discussion panellists are Elizabeth Tidd, Kate Carruthers and Alexis Tyndall, and the session will be facilitated by Roxanne Missingham. Elizabeth Tidd was appointed New South Wales Information Commissioner and CEO of the Information and Privacy Commission New South Wales in 2013, and in 2016 was appointed New South Wales Open Data Advocate. Ms Tidd has extensive regulatory and governance experience in a range of jurisdictions and industries, including commercial, not-for-profit and public sector oversight. Kate Carruthers is Chief Data and Insights Officer for UNSW Sydney and is also an adjunct senior lecturer in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. Kate is a member of the New South Wales Government's Data Analytics Centre Advisory Board and last year was appointed to the Microsoft Regional Director Program for her work in cybersecurity. Alexis Tyndall is Manager Digital Innovation at the University of Adelaide Library. She is establishing a Digital Humanities Lab Program, leading the library's support for digitally innovative projects and contributing to digital innovation in the library. And facilitating the panel session is Roxanne Missingham, University Librarian at ANU, leading a portfolio that includes libraries, archives, the press, privacy, copyright and digital scholarship. Over to you, panel. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and welcome everybody to this session and welcome to the conference. It's wonderful that we have so many people with us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples whose lands and airways we meet on today. I'm on the land of the Ngunnawal people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So the changing nature of custodianship of information. When we were discussing the format of the different sessions that we had, we thought it was time to have a conversation with a wide variety of people outside the GLAM sector, as well as within the GLAM se sector to be able to to contextualise the challenges we have in a new and diverse way. We've already heard speakers today speak about the differences between being custodians of information, of collections of data, being owners of data in different ways, being users, and really uh, leading to the role of what is the executive decision making that needs to sit around it. Vince Cerf at the Cardano Virtual Seminar, Summit last year said um, of the internet that it was rich in its revolution, new in ideas and new application. Its very open architecture invites people to invite new, new ways of using it, but this introduces new kinds of governance, con governance concerns. What do we do about misinformation, which we've talked about today? Malware, um, which is propagated through the network about someone in one country who is harmed by another. For anyone who's interested in governance, there is simply a wide open space here for hard work and for international agreements. So I think we are absolutely in the land of hard work, one where we are having to reinvent, reconceptualize, and in fact, look into the histories and the nature of the people who are affected by the information which resides in our networks. We're starting to see discussions about biometrics. Will we walk into our libraries and have biometric identifiers? Are people tracking us by the use of mobile devices? There is a university that does actually have a record of where people are and they use it to find what doors are not used, but it could be used in other and different ways. Who is responsible for all this information? There are many different dimensions that we need to think about. Collections, whose knowledge is it? talked about a little bit about that before, but how, what is the nature of collection building, which to a large 
degree has been built on, you know, the winners of history who wrote the books who are represented in our collections. How does changing technology affect what we're doing? How does changing community expectations affect what we're doing? There's been a radical change in the expectations of people about the nature of information we hold. And particularly as we digitise material and we've digitised a lot of company records here, including employment records, people have different expectations about privacy, about access, uh, about the control that we have than they did five years ago. We see changing services that support students' examinations where we need to ensure privacy. We need changing support for data collection. And there are risks all around, but we as a profession have often been criticised for being overly conservative and not thinking about the broader societal impact of the work, the collections, the nature of our services in a broader internet connected world. I just want to start off with three things that sort of highlight some of the complexity before I hand over to Elizabeth, our first speaking, first speaker. One of the first is, is that porous nature of the world, which encourages the creation of innovation in many different ways. So in the last week and a half, we've seen over 3 million US drivers, personal data exposed in a data breach. We've seen Services New South Wales reveal that um, of 104,000 people whose data was compromised, they could only contact about 70% of them. So even if we have processes in place that are good and we're trying to connect the world and create uh, better connections around data, there are gaps that are often impossible to get across. And the third thing I just wanted to contextualise in terms of the risk and the challenges that we face is, of course, last week we had um, the Myanmar military coup of the government. We have a lot of Myanmar research in the university. One of the uh, professors from uh, Macquarie University who's been providing economic advice uh, to Aung San Suu Kyi was arrested on Friday. And of course, anyone can mine all of the open access data, publications and data that we've made, made available to draw connections between the people who have been studying um, and publishing on Myanmar and pull together networks in a new and different way uh, that we've not anticipated. And I won't even talk about the infected virus, viruses that have been found to live on machines in academia. You've seen lots of stuff on the foreign interference legislation. So it is a world of great risk, a world that is very porous, a world where the greater smarts that sit outside our environments, whether we're government, whether we're academic, whether we're public libraries, whether we're state libraries, uh, is becoming more and more challenging for us. And so we've been very fortunate to bring together people today who will start our conversations with around uh, seven minutes or so, each introducing what they think are some key themes that we should be thinking about. And then we absolutely encourage you to put questions either in the ask a question or in the chat uh, within the Delegate Connect platform. And we will use those to have a deep conversation for hopefully about half of this session. So we're really keen to engage with you. But on that note, I might hand over to Elizabeth. So I will just go into share screen to do that. There we go. Share. Thank you, that, um, thank you Roxanne. And Roxanne is managing my slides for me, everyone, so that um, I hopefully am more engaging for you. Um, I wanted to thank all the participants, and there's a vast number of them, for this opportunity to join in a vast community that is a committed community and a highly influential community. So today, um, Roxanne, thank you. I wanted to speak about government information and artificial intelligence. So the importance of government information has been recognised since at least 209 BC. This is a terracotta warrior and it might surprise you to know that he's a bureaucrat. He's smiling, that, so that doesn't necessarily go hand in hand but um, he was found with parchment and with quills, recognising the importance of documenting government information and in particular government decision-making. So 
even now though, with legislation throughout every jurisdiction in Australia and at the Commonwealth level to enshrine the right to access information, we have in most jurisdictions um, a definition of government inter information that is technologically neutral. So that means whether information is buried in a portal or um, hovering around in a cloud somewhere, it's still government information and it still enlivens citizen access rights. The new challenge in this digital environment is the reviewability of machine enhanced decision making. And I'll take you to a couple of the um, most relevant and cutting edge cases that we're seeing dealing with how to obtain government information to enable citizens to assert their rights to review a government decision. And it's in the absence, in the absence of information, there is no reviewability. So we must preserve the right to we must preserve government information first and foremost, and then the citizens' access right. So thank you, Roxanne. If we turn to the next slide and just look at um, what are the changes in this landscape? And in my view, and I've published this in um, a couple of reports recently, there are three immutable features that dominate the government information landscape. Digital government, so we're delivering services online, and data, we're acquiring vast amounts of data. Increasingly, and largely driven by technology, we're entering into new partnerships and outsourcing arrangements. And the third model is one that presents an altogether different challenge. And that is novel models of government that transcend traditional sectorial arrangements. I'll talk to you in a few moments about a case that um, has been determined, but it involves a portal and that portal requires input from various sectors. So the local council sector is one sector, the government sector is another. So we're transcending what was traditional, not only agency silos, but the levels of government. And that presents new risks to information. Thanks, Roxanne. So Within the Information and Privacy Commission in New South Wales, we have been examining um, how people feel about their right to access information. And we've done that every two years since 2014. And over that period, the rate of importance um, allocated by citizens who have been surveyed ranges between 79 and 82% of people saying, look, the right to access information is incredibly important. And in terms of citizen rights, that's a very high score, a really very high score. We've delved a little deeper now. We've started looking at, well, how does the community feel about data sharing? Because government has to share their data to deliver these new online services. And it's really interesting to see that there's a quid pro quo. So yes, you can use my de-identified information and in particular, you can use it to plan services and to inform policy. But coupled with that is an expectation that government will be accountable. Citizens are telling us that there must be reporting by government agencies of its machine, machine learning adaptations, its technology for machine learning and what decisions are impacted by machine learning. And it must tell citizens what information they actually hold. That's incredibly important because in the absence of knowing, where would they start looking? Thanks, Roxanne. So most legislation operates according to a public interest test. And there may be some of you who are enthusiasts of um, modern history and recognise that Winston Churchill's um, approach to the appeasement policy of his own government provides a contemporary insight into what the public interest actually means. So Winston Churchill sought to challenge his government's appeasement policy that was adopted in relation to Nazi Germany. And he did this by eliciting information from senior public servants. They gave him the information and he was in a better position to challenge the policy, but it came at a cost. And when those senior public servants were charged, if you like, um, with breaching the code, which required them to um, be loyal to the government of the day, Winston Churchill was very vocal and very vocal publicly in saying that the loyalty to the state and the people must be superior to the loyalty to any government of the day. As I understand history, um, those 
senior servants were not in fact subject to the action that would have been forthcoming had it not been for this very, very public statement about the public interest being a dominant feature of a, a test of service. So that's why public servants are serving the public. If I turn to the next slide now, I will take you to the two cases I've mentioned. I'm going to deal with the last one first, which is Calderwood. That's a determined decision, and hence you see the citation there. Calderwood um, and the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and a couple of councils dealt with a circumstance in which largely citizens were applying to either their local council or to the department seeking information about the combustible cladding register. Now, that register was established using live inputs from various sources so that as New South Wales uh, commenced its journey on to being able to identify the buildings that had combustible cladding, it became a live database, a very important database. Citizens and others wanted access to know, well, for example, a tenant would like to know whether their building is affected. Now, it's not unusual to have outcomes of applications where there are different decisions made depending upon the agency. But in this matter, a couple of the councils responded by saying, actually, the information is not held by us. It's in a portal. We're only able to access a slice of that information. So our decision is it's not held. Others were relying upon a copiad, which is a conclusive presumption against disclosure of the information, largely because of health and safety. So on the face of it, all valid outcomes. But it does really represent that third immutable feature I talked about, where we transcend traditional sectoral um, lines of government and where do citizens go to acquire the information that they need to acquire to inform their decisions about their, their lives but also to understand how government is making its decisions and be accountable to the citizen government serves. The current case, um, the one not in citations because it's not yet determined, is O'Brien and the Department of Community Service, uh, Communities and Justice. It's a very interesting case about a person who was the recipient of a social housing subsidy. Now, to come up with that subsidy for particular um, tenancy arrangements, the department contracted with a third party, a small IT provider, and commissioned them with developing the algorithm to inform its decision making about what subsidy should apply. So when Ms O'Brien sought to challenge the subsidy being applied by the department, she applied to the department. The department said, we don't hold that information, it's held by a third party contractor. She sought that information through the Gipper Act and it's currently before the MCAT in New South Wales with a couple of arguments that are really interesting. One, firstly, the department doesn't hold it. Two, they cannot acquire it from a third party because the operation of the provision under which they would be able to acquire it to the government to be able to provide it to the citizen is linked to the provision of services. Now, the third party provider is saying, we don't provide a service, we inform government decision making. So it's not a service and therefore it wouldn't be captured under the Act. Furthermore, if you find that it should be captured, then we say this is our intellectual property and you cannot have access to that. This is a live case, a live current case, looking at how citizens will understand decisions of government that impact their daily lives. And in my last slide now, thanks Roxanne, I'll turn to the sort of advice and information that I'm providing agencies and citizens to ensure that in this digital world, we ask the right questions when we enter into these contracts, when we um, create new agencies or structures of delivering services, government services. The first question that you need to ask, um, particularly when you're commissioning um, a third party contractor or dealing with new data sources, who holds the information? Is it an agency? Is it a third party provider? How will access be provided? So if it is a third party provider, does the citizen have an entitlement through established legislation that enshrines the right to access information? Or will there be a carve out? And will that carve out go to the contract under which you engage that provider? And thirdly, in what form can access be provided? Will the citizen need a data scientist to enable them to understand the algorithm or the test suite and to actually challenge government decision making to assert the rights that are enshrined in legislation.
So thank you, Roxanne. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. That's just gave us some extraordinary insights into the complexity of information and knowledge and, and rights and responsibilities and the role of government and how important that is for trust, uh, which is the basis of our confidence in our democratic system. Thank you. Uh, next is Kate Carruthers. Kate, would you like to take the stage, the I virtual will, stage? I will indeed, and I'm going to issue um, PowerPoint slides. I'm just going to talk to you for a moment. Um, I think this area we're all grappling with and having a large institution that manages a tremendous number of different sources of data is, is quite interesting shall we say, and quite daunting when you consider the amount of it. Um, so we've actually established a data governance program that brings to the table all of the people that need to be at the table, including uh, risk, cybersecurity, privacy, the library, records management, as well as the data owners or data creators or data custodians. And to me, it, it really is a team sport, especially now that we've got AI, ML, uh, bots and related technologies being used across all of those data sources and people not always understanding the implications of what they're doing. Uh, so that, that to me is the first thing is, is it's a team sport. No one's got the one answer. So very much we need to be collaborative with this. Uh, and we always bring in the librarians because um, they actually manage a huge amount of our data sets uh, and are responsible for publications as well. So they're an important part of this. But we also bring in records management because everybody forgets them, but they are actually re responsible for, the, for our compliance with the State Records Act, uh, which is important. Uh, and also for our compliance with our federal grant uh, grant bodies, because we actually have obligations to them. So I think this is very much a team sport thing. And across all of it, we actually need to make sure that the data is safe. This is everybody's key focus. But not everybody has a clear understanding of what they need to do to keep their data safe. And we came to a realisation about five years ago that we used to give our researchers zero support in keeping their data safe. So they would do their ethics approvals and then we'd go, see you later, good luck, bye, and leave them to manage their data on their own. And uh, we, we have realised that and started to provide support for them. So now we have encrypted storage facilities for them and other support mechanisms uh, because we realised that not that it's like the future, that knowledge about cybersecurity and how to protect your data is unevenly distributed. And we're also working with them to develop some, uh, pr some policy and procedural approaches to how we can do AI, ML, bots and related technologies uh, safely in the research space and in the enterprise space. Because there are a lot of advantages to this, but increasingly we can discover that we can see things that we would potentially not have otherwise seen. Uh, so that we've actually had data sets where we've been able to reveal things about people that they probably didn't mean to disclose to us because we start to aggregate data sets. And this is part of the challenge that we've found with the Data Analytics Centre and with our work at the university. The more data sets that you aggregate, the more likely you are to be able to individually identify somebody who did not intend for that to happen, especially in some of our clinical data sets. So we, we need to think about ways that we can protect people. And I actually think that the whole consent model is almost broken and we need to come up with some new ways to approach this. And I think this is a problem that's facing the entire world of privacy practitioners at the moment. How do we come up with a new model that's not consent for every single thing? You know, because you go mad. You know, we've all had it with those cookie, those blasted cookie notifications on every website. It's like, yes, yes, I'll just accept it. But we don't know what we're accepting. And, and it is literally possible 
for sites to track us across the entire globe and to understand at a really detailed level what we are doing, what we are seeing and what we are buying. And we did not consent to that. So this consent model, I kind of feel, is broken. So it's across a whole number of areas. Um, in our institution, we've, been, we've got a, a program of data sharing agreements. So anybody internally that wants to use data from one system or another needs to have consent of the data owner. Uh, if we have data from an external source, we need their permission. So we write an explicit agreement for, for every instance of that. And we're starting to realise that that is not an entirely sustainable model because writing an agreement for everything is really time consuming. So we're starting to explore new ways of approaching this technologically enabled ways, safe technological ways of, of doing this. So there's a whole lot of unknowns and a whole lot of things that we need to work on. So the things that seem to me to be, we need to ensure that we keep our data safe from cyber attacks. Uh, malware is an increasing problem. We need to make sure that we can maintain the confidentiality, integrity and availability of our data. And we need to make sure that only people who are explicitly committed to see data can see it. And this implies a level of organisational structure that most, most people haven't started to contemplate how we put that together for this brave new world. Uh, so I think it's an emerging area and yeah. increasingly uh, with, with the simple to use technology for AI and ML, ordinary people can just use this out of the box and they don't understand the implications of what they're doing. So we need to have governance of this. And increasingly with the growth of the Internet of Things, we're actually going to need to manage this at scale at the edge of the networks, not just in our own networks. In the olden days, uh, we used to hide safely behind our firewalls and everything was safely protected. Now that's gone. Yeah. Now the perimeter is wherever there's a human being who's interacting with your organisation. And that perimeter is defended by identity and access management technologies. So the perimeter is now identity, not the firewall. And that makes it much more beneficial, much beneficial because we all went home and worked from home. We can work from wherever we want to now, but it makes the security issues increasingly challenging. So we've got this shift in the, the perimeter. We've got the confluence of all the federal government try to protect us from foreign interference, which is a genuine threat. Uh, and we've also got the need to make data accessible. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things that are starting to make organisations look at this. And the one thing I will say in closing is it is very much a team sport. No one has the one answer for this. You've got to get folks who know stuff around the table and you need to have conversations and work together because we're not going to solve this alone. Thanks. That was terrific. Thank you so much, Kate. Alexis. Hello. Um, thanks, Roxanne. Um, and thanks, Kate and Elizabeth. I think that in my job, I might sleep better at night than both of you <laughs> with all those worries on your mind. I am going to use a PowerPoint presentation today just to help keep me on track. Um, so hopefully, let's just see. Can you see it? All right. So um, I, in opening, I'd very much like to pay my respects to the Ghana people, the original custodians of the land on which I live and work. I'd like to acknowledge their deep and ongoing relationship with country. And I'd very much like to extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us at this event today. Um, seven minutes isn't much time to share my thoughts on AI and information custodianship. So what I'm gonna do is leap in with the th three key drivers that brought me into this space and have prompted me to help work to establish an Australian and New Zealand chapter of artificial intelligence for libraries, archives and museums, or AI for LAM, as we like to call it. <laughs> um, firstly, we have a lot of data. Our sector cares for data and digital material, whether it's the digital products of research, digitised collections, metadata, web archives, social media archives, the growing collection of e-resources like we see with the National e-Deposit Scheme that's been launched in recent years, 
grey literature and all those sorts of things. So in 2021, it's no news to anyone that the core business of libraries, archives and museums extends far, far into the digital space. Our collections include huge quantities of digitised and born digital text, images, sound, moving images, art, software, algorithms, things like that as well, many other things. So this means we need to think about different ways of organising and using our vast digital collections. If you want to conduct research on the entirety of the Australian Twitter archive, reading it a page at a time ain't going to cut it. So how can we make sure that we can continue to fulfil the expectations of our users, including the research community in academia, industry and the general public, when so much of our source material is now digital? We really have to be thinking about computational tools for organising, discovering and managing our collections and supporting that community that are using them to analyse our collections. As a community, we need to see to ask, how ready are our collections for research using artificial uh, intelligence technologies and machine learning tools? And how ready are we as professionals to work with those users? The second point, we have a lot of data. No, I haven't had a PowerPoint malfunction there. <laughs> it's actually the same as the first point. Um, I suspect that the collections that I've described could actually be really useful for those developing and improving the applications of artificial intelligence. Um, this is really deliberately worded as a question. Um, I don't have time to go into the many dimensions of this question, including ethical relationships and oversight, the fact that many of our collections are about people and their lives, and then in many cases, we are not the owners or decision makers about the cultural material in our collections and such work would need to be approached with a very high degree of care. But to look at it at a really simple level, <clears throat> do you want to improve predictive text for Australian users, but all your training data comes from Americans on the internet? Where might you find big collections of Australian created text? Do you want to explore cultural specificity and sentiment analysis or evolving language in multicultural communities to improve natural language processing and machine translation? Where would you find diverse, organised collections of text gathered over a period of time? And most crucially, how useful would it be if those collections were expertly managed by experienced information managers? Which brings me really nicely to my third, the third component of my motivation. Like many of you, I've read the discussions in the articles in popular and technical literature about bias in applications of AI the stories of dramatic ethical failures and the misapplication of automated decision-making functions. Where might I find a professional group with expertise and experience in managing large amounts of information, maintaining and describing context, thinking about ethical use of that information and with a deep and growing understanding of bias in our collections? I'm an optimist when it comes to interdisciplinary collaboration. I am not, definitely not the only one, think that there's great potential for librarians, archivists and other information management professionals to contribute to the development and application of AI. Um, I like this quote from an article that is titled Lessons from the Archives, Strategies for Collecting Sociocultural Data in Machine Learning by Yuan Su Zhou and Tim McGebru. In that article, they call for AI practitioners to consider archival and library science approaches to the challenges in data collection, including consent, inclusivity, power, transparency, ethics, and privacy. I think many of the issues that Kate and Elizabeth have already brought up um, tap into those things as well. We have a challenge in common. So these are the perspectives that made me say yes when Ingrid Mason, who is known to many of you, invited me to work with her and other colleagues to establish an Australian and New Zealand chapter of AI for LAM last year. Um, we were drawing on an initiative that strung, uh, sprung forth from international collaborations in 2018 and 19, and we aim to establish a community of practice and critical reflection for Australia and New Zealand, encouraging discussion and knowledge transfer around how AI and all its various guises might shape users' information practices and expectations in cultural heritage institution and institutions and clients. The participants in this chapter today include technologists, tech enthusiasts and the tech curious, and none of us profess comprehensive expert knowledge in the area. Our initial call of interest attracted 90 registrations with the majority of the interest coming out of the university and library sector. Our small volunteer team is focused on showcasing and sharing experiences and ideas through talks and contributing to the global project showcase, as well as supporting knowledge and capability building. In monthly online talks, we've heard from several libraries, archives and museums who are already applying AI technologies to their collections. This has included efforts to speed description through the application of machine learning to image tagging at the Auckland War Memorial Museum, 
and at the National Archives of Australia who are testing auto classification clustering and index tools as part of a future digital approach to all agency records authorities. Um, the National Library of Australia joined us to share their collaboration with data science researchers that has actually gone on to become an embedded part of their trove discovery tools. And our Victoria University colleagues shared a beautiful project they used machine learning to generate creative new perspectives on the collections associated with 19th century New Zealand botanist, printer and explorer, William Colenso. And you can see some samples of the work that's been generated through that project on this slide here. We've seen a range of, oh, this is our group and a call to get on board. Um, we've seen a range of interesting and boutique applications of artificial intelligence in Australia and New Zealand institutions through our webinars which I think is exactly the way that it should be. I wanna echo Genevieve's Bell, Genevieve Bell's comment early in her talk that we should have to break down the monolith of AI for this community. And that's what I think we've seen in the presentations to date. Experimental limited scope projects are an excellent way for us to test the waters, identify challenges, improve our familiarity with how appropriate applications of artificial intelligence are for our collections, including where they aren't. The focus of AI for Lamb internationally and in our region is to be a participatory community, to support peer learning and to work through these issues together. I don't have all the answers and I thank Roxanne for sort of inviting me to close with a couple of questions. And I've put a couple up here that might be food for thought. I definitely don't think we'll cover them in the panel discussion today. But are we ready? Are our collections ready? How can we prove our readiness? Are we ready to play in this space? What do we need? Technical resources, policy? How about skills and mindset? as well. How do we upskill ourselves and our colleagues and our new professionals not to be intimidated by, our, by these challenges? We don't need to be an expert in AI to participate in this space, and we, but to participate we need to think about what it is that we do need to know. And how can we collaborate effectively? And would collaborating with AI practitioners actually, um, and collaborating in a way that brings our expertise to the table be a different form of collaboration for um, archivists, librarians and, and other information management professionals. Um, we're not providing just support to them, which we do many times with the research community, but an exchange of expertise. And does that change how we view ourselves? Um, so with that, I'd sort of like to give us some time for discussion and uh, thanks for inviting me to participate on this panel. Stop sharing. Thank you very much. That was terrific and um, so provocative and wonderful in that we have lots of questions that won't be able to be answered here or necessarily next year. So I think it's an issue that the organisers of the conference want to have some further sessions on to start articulating different ways that our profession should be reacting. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, coming in. So I'll start with the second one first. One of the challenges for us, and this very much uh, echoes uh, Elizabeth's comments about New South Wales uh, government decision-making is that the, the data that we collect on individuals, for example, use of resources within our collections, um, often resides in third-party systems in the cloud. Um, and it may be that we have no contractual uh, ability to obtain access to that information. Um, it's a very complex area. In the public library, we have lots of people using um, Belinda's borrow box and overdrive. And at times in the old days, we would have people uh, uh, from various secret services who would want to find access of what um, individuals borrowed and we always used to deny that on the basis that we control the information and that that was not an appropriate use. But in this new age, we don't know necessarily how that information can be used. Uh, it's quite a different challenge when we're thinking about uh, people and what we're promising them and what their expectations are. And often these contracts we entered into 15, 20 years ago without any concept of the nature of the protections we would need to have. Does anyone want to comment on that? I mean, it's to a degree, it's legacy systems and things that we haven't had the time to review and our responsibility. Roxanne, we're, we're actually having a discussion with the university library at the moment about um, tracking, because we can because we can now, we can track what who's accessing what course materials, which are obviously e-books e that the library puts out. Um, and we're having discussions about the granularity with which we will share that with people because 
um, librarians are very conscious of protecting people's privacy, but we can still see the utility in a lecturer knowing that 100% of a course didn't read that book, which means that book's not working. So trying to balance those is, is a conversation that we're having right now. Yep. That's a very good point. I'm um, offering a, a different dimension um, to the valid dimension that's been offered by Kate. And that is that as we contract out, why is it that we should lessen citizens' rights? Traditional government services, I'm, I'm going to the O'Brien case previously, that algorithm would have been an Excel spreadsheet, downloadable and provided to the tenant. We've got a third party involved here on two levels, one for the social housing provision, fine, that's, that model's been around for decades, and two, to calculate but it becomes the IP. We're trying to retrofit contracts, as you say, that are 15 years old. That's not always going to be possible, but if we keep front of mind that as legacy systems are laid to rest, that we look at what service and has it been a traditional mm. government service and who we're contracting with and what right does government have to get that information back into its hands because Largely, that information is derived from citizens. It becomes government information, but it derives from citizens, and that's where its value lies. A very good point. Alexis, do you want to add anything? No, I think you, I, you both have far more to offer in relation to that question than I do. I think that, um, I mean, I think there's an element to saying we need a, uh, a more sophisticated and less scared approach to inquiring about the ethical oversight of certain things. I mean, many of the examples of things that we've seen through the AI for LAM network have been libraries or um, other institutions that because they don't necessarily have the human resource or the technical resource to launch their own large scale AI program are using things like the um, user friendly tools provided by Google, um, Microsoft and IBM. Um, and it's nice to see that the care with which these things have been approached and saying, well, you know, we could do this with a fairly safe, non-controversial collection, but we know for this reason that is articulated really clearly why we can't do it with certain other collections. And I think we're doing that um, as we test out the waters in this space, but we shouldn't be afraid to sort of push that back on those companies, um, whether they're contractors to government, whether they're contractors to the university as well, and talk about what are the ethical oversight provisions that you have and not just accepting a form statement, but saying we want to actually be involved in um, in demanding um, what 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 you've got there and what you're willing to come forward with. Um, also, a question in terms of the readiness or the capabilities of people in our profession to deal with these complex issues. You and Kate Alexis have very much talked about the fact it's a family, it's a village that needs to bring solutions. Um, and Elizabeth has really highlighted that often we're not aware of the complexity of issues until they actually hit us. Are there some areas that you think uh, we need to be developing either in the courses that we run in universities or the discussion papers and online uh, resources that we make available through our professional associations? Would anyone like to comment on that? Well, I think it's very much all of the above. I, I will um, make the point, you, it might have got lost in what I was saying, Legal very much have a role to play and they're around the table. So they're involved in the privacy and compliance perspective. And we typically do not write, do not enter into an agreement unless we retain the rights to our student data or our staff data. So we're very, very careful about that because we've watched other universities get burned in the past. Uh, so that's a really strong practice for us. Um, I think Roxanne, like I, that's a really good question and I think it's, you know, there's weeks and weeks of webinars to talk about that. But I think that um, some of the skills that we are already thinking about are actually just really important to this area and recognising that we have expertise to offer. So data literacy is something that we've been talking about for a very long time. We, you, to work as an information management professional now, you have to have data literacy and you have to be open-minded to ongoing learning in that space. Um, it's one of the reasons that I actually sometimes don't like to talk about artificial intelligence because that sounds really big and scary and as though you have to be a very advanced coder or you have to be um, to understand how to put together an algorithm. Uh, most of the people who are, I, I believe, this is a massive guess, but the people who are listening to us today are never going to have to put together an algorithm. But 
Can we help them be capable of talking to someone who can put together an algorithm? Can we, be, can we help them be capable and confident to ask questions of that person and not go, I'm not a techie person, I don't know. So being able to say there are no dumb questions that you do have expertise to bring to the table, particularly when it comes around ethical um, oversight of these sorts of things, the context of the data, the nature of the data that we're working with, and some things that may be unanticipated by people who don't have the rich background in data management that we do. Um, I do think also why, when I don't like to talk about artificial intelligence, I do like to talk about using computational tools, um, making data accessible, using data standards, talking about interoperability. And so looking at ways where um, you can look at your own collections and see how accessible they might be for someone who's wanting to use a computational tool. I did it in my previous role, I was working at the Australian Research Data Commons and I had the great pleasure of talking to a number of institutions about the interoperability of their online collections. And one thing that they reported is that when their collections were highly interoperable, it wasn't necessarily um, that they weren't necessarily seeing great use of it by um, researchers using computational tools, but actually by other aggregators and other institutions that could tap into their data. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, in many cases, we need to bring data together across different places. We need to bring large amounts of data together and having a pretty sophisticated understanding of interoperability is a good part of that. And confidence. There are no dumb questions. You've got good things to offer to the table. Absolutely. I think increasingly too, the tools are just in there. So you can use uh, online tools in Microsoft to look at correlates and outliers for, for data sets. You do not need any special technical skills to do that. It works out of the box. It's machine learning under the covers, but you're not using any machine learning. So people have this capability on their desktops in the cloud now, uh, and people are obviously using it because it's there. But what we need to do is, is provide guidance for people so that they understand the implications of some of the things that could go wrong with Yep. Elizabeth, do you have any comments? I don't think I could add to on the comments of Kate and Alexis. I think they've covered the field. But I, I would reinforce there are no dumb questions. Very helpful comment. And I think I just wanted to go back to Kate's comments about the fact that often we're collecting data for very good purposes. For example, we want to know that students are doing some readings, attending some classes so that we can reach out to them early if there are problems. And the challenge of understanding, certainly from the ANU data breach, the challenge of people understanding what data we hold on them is actually quite immense. And so I wonder, what you think our responsibility is in terms of communicating to our broad audience the range of uh, information that we have relating to them, particularly in archival collections. I don't even know if that's possible in mm -hmm. our archival collections. Who knows what's there? <laughs> I might offer an observation there. Accessibility is also about I guess, digestibility, you know, what formats are you in, um, what information are you actually giving someone? So someone asks for a grain of sand and you give them a beach. This is, we are challenged by, and you people are best placed to look at how information is categorised, how it's um, accessible to people, because you've done that through generation upon generation, through the centuries. Now, there's yet another new challenge, but the tools that you have already developed in information management will set you in the right position to be able to be the best governance um, managers of the repository of information that you oversight. Mm. Yeah, no, sorry, go on, Kate. I was just going to add that the government is going to make all of us much more accountable, especially with this foreign interference uh, legislation. So the government is going to start to hold us accountable for knowing who's who's accessing what, who's, you know. So our landscape is about to change, our information landscape is about to change in fairly significant ways over the next five years, I suspect. Alexis, I think you wanted to say something. 
Uh, all I was going to say, Roxanne, is that I think over many a project and many a job, I've seen people intimidated by the scale of, you know, whether it's digitisation of collections, whether it's cataloguing, whether it's supporting data-enabled research. And um, that's, that's, that's no reason to stop or no reason to, um, to not start. And so that's, um, it's about having a, a, a growth mindset in this area and about having an ability to break this down into the parts, see it as a team, break down the monolith that AI is and, um, and see, what, see what we all have to offer in this situation. Yep. And to be able to have the supporting systems if something happens and something's discovered to come into action appropriately. And I'm so, I sort of recall the early digitisation at the National Library where a lot of the archives um, trying to reach the community, we advertised in the Government Gazette that we had these collections and were going to digitise them. And I don't think, I don't see the Government Gazette as a reading tool <laughs> to communicate to the people of Australia. <laughs> But you have to, there are times when you have to try something. So we have to learn from it. Um, now, we've got a couple of minutes to go. I, and I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment. I thought I'd give you each an opportunity to do a little wrap up at the end of what you think some of the, the key challenges or opportunities are. And you may well want to call on your early comments because I do think they were really helpful in identifying that it is a very complex field with many players. And the fact that we are having a discussion across all of these different professional groups is really healthy and positive. Um, Kate, do you want to start off? Sure. Thank you. Um, I, th I think really the important thing is having these sorts of conversations because uh, we're starting out on this journey. It's very early in the life cycle of AI and related technologies. We've still got our trainer wheels on pretty much globally. Um, there's really interesting things happening, but we're only going to do them safely if we collaborate. And I really do encourage people to collaborate, ask questions. I think what Alexa said, there are no stupid questions. You know, just let's talk. Thank you. Alexis. Look, I think um, it's lovely to see some threads coming through these conversations here. I'd absolutely assert what Kate has said about this being teamwork situation everybody has a part to play everybody has expertise to bring to this table I also want to say like what Elizabeth said about transparency and the use of these technologies as well the more we talk about I mean that's it's a very particular application that Elizabeth was talking about where government is using machine learning technologies but I would encourage people to talk about the use of machine learning because the, no project is too small. Everybody who contributes to this space, everybody who shares what they're doing in this space is actually helping the community understand these things better. And I would, of course, encourage you to um, join the ai 4 lamb AUNZ chapter um, to meet with some like-minded peers and um, have some thought-provoking webinars. Thank you. Elizabeth. I think I'd just add that your sector is the interface to the community. It can be, in fact, a, a virtual community because of the manner in which you operate. You create communities um, because they come to you for knowledge, they come to you for information. So just in the same way as you had the Gazette to say, this is the information we have, we now have search engines. And how you organise and influence the outcomes of searches is going to be about accessibility now. It's just a different paradigm. New challenges, um, new questions to ask. But as both speakers have said, and you, Roxanne, starting that conversation, um, asking as many questions as you can. And um, when we talk about interoperability, looking across sectors, how are they doing it across oceans, but how are they doing it next door in the sector near me, like the university sector, for example, and learning that um, these new arrangements for delivering services that, that transcend sectors may also, also be a real benefit to those of us who are charged with being um, the best stewards of information we can be. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful way to end, Elizabeth. So when people talk about libraries, they often talk about us as holding the memory of the nation, the memory of the world, and how we revitalise that in a, in a digital environment, reprise it, 
uh, open up the box in a sensitive way, but also then collect the new digital information, which has never been housed in the sort of formats that have made it inaccessible, really brings new challenges and opportunities. So I would like to do two things at the end. I would like to us to virtually thank all of the speakers on the panel. It's been absolutely fantastic. So thank you. And then the second thing I'd like to do is very much encourage everyone to when you have the survey or when you're using the chat to give us ideas about future events and future opportunities that we need to create to take this topic forward. So thank you everybody for your time and attention today, in particular thank you to the presenters. And uh, we look forward to your feedback for the next part of this journey. Thank you.